because Christ is coming, it's time to wake up and live right. This morning we are in Romans chapter 13, verse 11 through 14. So finishing up that chapter in Romans 13. What Paul has been doing up to this point, he began it in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. He has been teaching us what it means to be people who give themselves as living sacrifices to God. Just to sum it up real briefly, he's told us that we have a responsibility in the church to use the gifts that God has given us inside the church, inside this assembly, in order to bless each other, in order to build each other up, so that we can do the work of the ministry. We have a responsibility to respond to problems in a Christ-like manner. We have a responsibility to pray for our enemies, to reconcile with those who have hurt us, to pursue peace insofar as it is possible in and of ourselves to arrive at a place of peace with all people. That is what we are called on. That is our worship. Not only that, we have a responsibility to the earthly governing authorities. We have a responsibility to submit to the government. We have a responsibility to pay our taxes and to show honor to whom honor is due. This is our spiritual worship. Not only these things. He has told us that it is our spiritual act of worship. Get this. It's not, it's not profound in that it's deep. It's profound in that it just should be so. Our spiritual worship means that we love each other. We love each other. We love each other with a, with a warm, familial affection, a brotherly love. That's how we are supposed to treat one another and care for one another. We're supposed to care for those in this body. We're supposed to care for all Christians. We are supposed to be a generous, loving, kind, warm people. That is our spiritual worship. And I keep repeating that, that is our spiritual worship, because I don't want us to ever become confused and think that worship is something that we only do through song. Worship is primarily not sung, it is lived out. Worship is lived out. You want to worship God? Pay your taxes. You want to worship God? Love your brother in Christ. Love your sister in Christ. You want to worship God? Reconcile with that enemy. You want to worship God? Live at peace with all peoples. You want to worship God? Use the gifts that God has given you in his church. Honor God in all of these things. This morning, what we're going to talk about is really a culmination of our worship to God. It is an attitude of expectancy that we are to have for the coming of the Lord Jesus. This morning, what I want to talk to you about is the urgency of holy living. You want to worship God? Live a holy life. That's the point. I could summarize the entirety of the sermon in this sentence if you want to write it down or it'll be on the board and you can uh, take a picture with your phone if you'd like to do that. It's simply this, because Christ is coming, it's time to wake up and live right. Because Christ is coming, it's time to wake up and live right. You say, wake up, I'm here, I'm awake. What do you mean, wake up? Paul's not going to be talking here about physical sleep. He's going to be talking about another kind of sleep that any one of us can fall into. Any one of us can fall into this sort of drowsiness where we're not really living in a ready state for the return of Jesus. You want to worship the Lord? Be ready for his coming. Because Christ is coming, wake up and live right. In just these few verses, Paul issues a number of commands. This morning, I've boiled them down really to two commands, two imperatives, two commands that you and I must obey in light of the imminent return of Christ. Imminent means it could happen at any time. It is upon us. It's literally right there above us. 
the imminent return of Christ. Two commands, two imperatives that you and I must obey due to the imminent return of Christ. Look at what Paul says here in verse 11. He's going to issue a command that it's time to wake up. Verse 11, he says this, Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. Imperative number one that you need to write down for this morning is this. You must live in readiness because of the imminent return of Christ. You must live in readiness because of the imminent return of Christ. He says, besides this, literally, he begins this section by saying, and this, on top of everything that I've said from Romans 12, give yourself as living sacrifices to all of the various applications. Besides all this, he says, you know the time. You know it. That, that, is, that is in the perfect tense. You, you know this. See, Paul is assuming that these commands that he is going to issue to these brothers and sisters in Christ, he, he assumes that they will be obeyed because of something that the people of God should readily recognize and know, something that should always be in the forefront of our mind, that the return of Christ is upon us. It is imminent. He says, besides this, you know the time. Well, what is the time? He says that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep, for you to wake from sleep. He says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 34. He says, wake up from your drunken stupor. He, he's actually talking to Christians as he says this. He says, wake up from your drunken stupor as is right and do not go on sinning. For some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. Paul was writing that to the church at Corinth. You see, it is entirely possible that Christians live their lives in a moral drowsiness. A moral drowsiness. He's not talking about physical sleep. He's talking about spiritual slumber. He, he's talking about, about when, when you just relax. And, and because you, you've relaxed and you're not anticipating the imminent return of Christ, you just say, you know what, I'll do whatever I want today. I'll take care of, of that Jesus stuff tomorrow. I'll get right with Jesus after these things that I'd like to do. And you just live in this moral drowsiness thinking it's okay to do whatever I want on a day-to-day -day basis because I'm, I'm set, I'm, I'm good with God. When he returns, well, I'm just safe. And so it really doesn't matter. See, moral drowsiness tends to turn into a spiritual apathy. It turns into a spiritual apathy. When we just let our guard down and we relax, the next thing we begin to do is to just not care. Just to not really care. I'll, I'll do my duty. I'll, I'll show up to church most of the time, but I'm just, that's about all that you can expect from me. I had a, a, a brother in Christ one time actually tell me this. He said, Brother Jordan, let me tell you the reason that I think that your vision for the church has failed. He said, your vision from the church has failed because, because you don't understand the way our community works. He said, our, our schools mean everything to our families. And, and our schools need our families to be participating in everything. And if our, if our kids are not participating in everything in the schools, the schools fail. He said, so Brother Jordan, th this is what you don't understand. And this is what you need to do if you want your vision for the church to succeed. Dear brother in Christ, he said, he said, you need to not expect for anybody in this church to do anything other than show up on Sunday mornings and hear you preach. 
and then for some of them to come on Wednesday nights for prayer meeting. But beyond that, you can't expect anything. We need to be careful before we dismiss that and say, well, how dare that brother say something like that? But I want us to think about it for a moment because I think he actually, in those statements, encapsulated what it means to be spiritually apathetic. Ask yourself, would you be okay showing up to church on Sunday and then doing nothing for the Lord the rest of the week? And for some to show up on Wednesday, but for the most part, I, we can expect everyone to be here on Sunday morning. That is spiritual apathy. That is moral drowsiness. That's not being aware of the time. Friends, if, if our kids don't participate in the schools and the schools fail, that's okay. You know what's not okay? What's not okay is for the local church to fail. That's not okay. The, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is the force that is mowing down the gates of hell, not the local ISD. As much as I love the schools, friends, the church is our first responsibility because we call Jesus Lord. We need to wake up and understand that the hour is upon us. The night is far spent. It's time to wake up from sleep. Because of the return of Christ, you must live in readiness. Just besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. So what is Paul saying here? When we first believed, that's when you trusted in Jesus. The moment you were born again, Paul is simply making this argument that when you were born again, that was farther away from Jesus' return than today is, meaning every moment that passes brings us closer and closer to the return of Christ. So what does he say? He says, because, because that hour is upon us, the hour of his return is upon us, he says, wake up, wake up. Listen to how Paul says this in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 11 through 16, talking about waking up from moral drowsiness. Ephesians 5, 11 through 16, he says, Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, listen to this, therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Look carefully then how you walk, that is, how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. We live in evil days. We live in dark days. We live in dark days when we put any sort of hope in a politician to help. That is a state of darkness. When we are putting our hope in fallible, corrupt man. These days are evil. These days are ruled by mankind. We are looking forward to the day where this world is ruled by King Jesus. We live in evil times, friends, and we need to understand that hour. We need to get our priorities straight. We need to wake up. Listen to what Paul says when he says, For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. What is he talking about salvation? We can confuse these terms if we're not careful. Many times when Paul's talking about salvation, he's using that word in the context of a person being justified. 
And what I mean by that is this. When a person says, Jesus, I believe in you, will you forgive me of my sins? What God does in a legal sense is he forgives your sins. That is called justification. It is God declaring you as righteous. And in that sense, in that moment, you are saved from your sins. That is called justification. What Paul is talking about here when he's talking about salvation is not the moment of justification. He is talking about the consummation of all things, Christ's return and his ultimate salvation of his people. We are justified in God's sight right now, but we are looking forward to a kingdom that is coming. It is already, but it is not yet. And when it comes, we are saved in the ultimate sense. And Paul's saying that day is nearer to us now than when we first believed. Listen to how Paul describes that day of salvation. Our blessed hope is what he calls it. Titus chapter 2, verse 11 through 14. He says, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. That is ultimately the day of our salvation. When Jesus returns for us, our blessed hope, and we take hold of that salvation for which God has promised us. So he says, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. Friends, it's time to wake up. You must live in readiness because of the imminent return of Christ. It's time to wake up, to, to rouse yourself from an apathetic slumber, from a moral drowsiness. It's time to wake up and be ready. In verses 12 through 14, Paul's not talking about waking up. Paul's talking about getting dressed. Time to wake up. Time to get dressed. I'll tell you a funny story. When I was a junior in college, we began the spring baseball season there at Rice, I, I remember we were preparing for our first road trip of the year, our first road trip of the year. And what we were doing is we were actually flying over to California because baseball season starts there at the beginning of February, end of January, and it's never cold there. They're blessed. But anyway, so we were getting in a plane to go, and we were going to go play Long Beach State and all these schools. And I remember that I forgot to pack I forgot to pack my clothes that night, the night before our trip. And funny thing, I was so tired, I just fell asleep. And I forgot to set my alarm. By the grace of God, I woke up. The bus was leaving at like 8 a.m. that morning, and I woke up at 7 a.m. Had nothing packed. I was not ready. I was not prepared in any way. And I knew that I was just a number on the team. And if I didn't get all my things together, I was getting left and they wouldn't care. I have never woke up and got dressed and packed that fast in my life before. I remember just throwing things in that suitcase and running out the door and, and pushing the speed limit there to get to school and to get on that bus. And I showed up right on time and I got there and nobody else was the wiser, but I tell you what, it'll never happen again. It will never happen again. I remembered in that moment, one of my high school coaches telling me, if you're not early, you're late. That's the way that Christians ought to live, right? If you're not early, you're late. You ought to live in a, a readiness for Christ to return. So wake up and get dressed. So how do, you, how do you get dressed and ready for the return of Christ? That's what he's going to explain to us in verses 12 through 14. See, getting dressed is not only about what you put on, it's about what you take off. Look at what Paul says. He says, the night is far gone 
The day is at hand. The night is far gone. When, when he talks about the night, what Paul is referring to is this present evil age. This age that we live in. In the Gospels, you recall multiple times, Jesus talked about this evil age. This evil and wicked and perverse generation. We are still in that time. We are still living in that evil age, that evil and wicked and perverse generation. We're still living in those days. And Paul says this. He says the night is far gone. He doesn't say it's all the way spent, but he says it's far spent. It's, it's far spent. It's, it's way past the halfway mark. And the time for this present evil age and and political elections and the things that we do in this life on a day-to-day -day basis, that time is coming to an end. It's coming to an end rapidly. The night is far gone. It's, it's far spent, and the day is at hand. The day of what? The day of Christ's appearing. The night, this present evil age is far spent, but the day of Christ's return is upon us. It is literally at hand. So what should we do based on this? He says, so then, let us cast off the works of darkness. Let us cast off the works of darkness. If we live in a present evil age, which is characterized by the night, then what are the works of darkness? The works of darkness are the things that are done in this present evil age. Paul says, cast them off. Listen to the call of God. When, when Paul stands before King Agrippa and he gives his account of his testimony in his life and his ministry in Acts chapter 26, listen to what he says that the Lord Jesus told him was his calling in life. Acts chapter 26, verse 16 through 18. Jesus said to Paul, But rise and stand to your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me, and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles, to whom I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Jesus was telling Paul, this is the reason I am sending you to preach Christ to the Gentiles, to the nations, so that even though they live in this present evil age, you can help deliver them from darkness. You can help deliver them from the power of the evil one, from the power of Satan, so that they may receive forgiveness of their sins. See, in, in Paul's impression here, in Paul's mind, we should be acting on these facts because we know them, because we know it to be true. Besides this, you know that the hour has come. These are things that should be on our mind all the time. Let me ask you a question, a very practical question. When is the last day that you woke up and asked yourself, am I ready today for Christ to return? Paul says that's the way we should be living every day of our lives. Am I ready today for Christ's return? A am I making sure that my neighbor and their family, they are ready? Am I making sure that my community is ready for Christ's return? If this is not on my mind, then I need to wake up. If this is not on my mind, then I have slipped into a, a, a sleep, this present evil age. Listen to what he says. So then let us cast off. That's a command. Let us throw it off, these garments of darkness, and put on the armor of light. Put on the armor of light. That word for armor is actually where you get the, the Greek noun hoplite. Hoplite. If you've been familiar with with ancient history, you've probably heard of what a hoplite was. See, a hoplite was a Grecian soldier. It was a Greek soldier that was armed to the teeth. It, it was essentially the equivalent of an, of an ancient Navy SEAL. See, the hoplite would have had armor all over his body. He's got the helmet with a giant Corinthian plume on top. 
He's covered in armor on his chest and on his legs all the way down to his feet. Even his feet are covered from piercing blows. And that hoplite would have a, would have a, a shield that would cover his entire shoulder, from his shoulder all the way down to below his knee. And in one hand, he would have the shield. In the other hand, he would have a spear. And that spear is ready to, to join in with the phalanx and to start mowing through the enemy. And that hoplite was moving around in these ancient times, and people knew that this man was ready for battle. This man was ready for war. He had already loosed all the garments that would weigh him down. He is only wearing the bare essentials. And Paul says, Christian, think of yourself in this way. Think of yourself as a hoplite having shed anything that will weigh you down from doing the will of God. Arm yourself with the bare essentials, with what you need to obey God and to live righteously in this present evil age. He says, cast off the works of darkness. Take them off and put on the armor of light. You say, well, what is the armor of light? A passage that is very familiar to many of us, Ephesians chapter 6. Listen to how Paul describes the armor of God, verses 10 through 18. Paul says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. That's the present evil age. That you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, I love this, and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith in which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end... Keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Paul leaves no doubt as to what is the armor of God, as to what he means by the armor of light, cinched up by the word of truth, God's word holding all of it together as a belt, a helmet of salvation, guarding our mind from doubt, guarding our mind from disparity, carrying the sword of truth, which is not only holding us together at the belt, but it is our weapon. In other places, Paul talks about how the weapons of our warfare, they're not of this world. They're mighty through God, and they are for the tearing down of spiritual strongholds. And he says, by the truth, we dismantle every false teaching, every faulty argument against God. How do we do that? By the word of God. By the word of God. He says, cast off all the non-essentials. Friends, this is never a non-essential. This is your armor. This is your weaponry. So Paul says, take it up. Cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Listen to what he says in verse 13. He says, let us walk properly. As in the daytime. We don't live in the daytime, do we? Paul's already said we live in the night. The night is far spent. But he says walk properly as though you're living in the daytime. Go ahead and live like you will live in the kingdom of God. You know what it means to be living properly? Listen to God's expectation of us. It says this, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. This is what God calls us. He says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, 
a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Friends, that's us. A holy people, a chosen people, a royal priesthood. And Paul says these priests are armed to the teeth with the armor of God, with the armor of light. That's what it means to wake up and to get dressed, to be prepared to live righteously in this present evil age. He says that you may walk properly as in the daytime, not in the night. Don't don't walk as is proper in the night because these are the things that are done at night. This is not an exhaustive list by any means, but it is an exemplary list. It's a list that shows us a bit of an example. It's a list of vices, much like what Paul does in many other places in his epistles. You can look at one in Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 through 21. For our time this morning, let's just look at these three sets of vices. You'll see what I mean as we read this. There are three noun pairs that that Paul joins together here. He says, let us walk properly as in daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual morality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy. That conjunction and in between each one of those joins these noun phrases together. He says, as is proper in the daytime, as a royal priesthood, a chosen people, putting on the armor of God, casting off the works of darkness, not living your life, he says, in orgies and drunkenness. You know, many times, those two types of sins go together, don't they? Many times, sexual immorality and deviance of all kinds goes right along with substance abuse. It goes right along with people being out of their right mind, surrendering control of themselves and handing it over to some sort of substance. May that be alcohol or some sort of other controlling substance. Many times when people walk in evil, it is because they have surrendered their self-control over to some sort of substance. And Paul says it shouldn't be so with us. That, that's not us. We, we don't need to numb the pain with narcotics and with alcohol. We don't need to do those things. We don't need to dull our senses. We need to be woke up. We need to be ready. Because there's certain things that happen when we walk around in substance abuse and in drunkenness, all sorts of evil and immoralities. He says not in orgies and in drunkennesses. Not in sexual immorality and sensuality. Sensuality meaning doing whatever feels good to the body. And many times what, the, what feels good to the body, to the flesh, is expressed through sexual immorality. But look, it's an unlikely pair that he pulls in here for the third. He says, not in quarreling and jealousy. Hmm. That'll take us some places, won't it? See, because if if the devil can't get you drunk, if he can't get you immoral, you know what he'll do? He'll get you divided. Maybe you say, you know, I I don't have a problem with substance abuse. That's not me. God's delivered me from that. I don't have a problem with sexual immorality. God has delivered me from that. And these are things that I wouldn't even be comfortable speaking about. But when's the last time you got in fights with your church family? When's the last time we allowed quarreling and jealousies and strifes to rule the body? Hadn't been that long ago, friends. And it ought not be so. These things will not happen if we are woke up and wearing the armor of light. We ought not be quarreling. We ought not have strife-filled contentions. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, Paul actually explains to the Corinthian church that divisions in the body is a telltale sign of spiritual immaturity. 
In fact, he goes so far as to say this. He says, I would love to give you the meat of the word. He said, but I can't. You're still on, you're still on a liquid diet. You're still on milk. I'd love to treat you as adults, but you act like children because all children do is fight with one another. Paul says that's not the way we should walk. We should walk as is appropriate for those who are moving towards the daytime. We're gonna cast off the works of darkness. Don't let the, the evil deeds of this present wicked generation to rule over us. No, we're not like that. We are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, filled with the Spirit of God, sanctified to walk in the light. And it should be so. We need to wake up and we need to get dressed. He says in verse 14, he says, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. He says, but put on the Lord Jesus. He says, take off all the non-essentials Gird yourself with the armor of light and ultimately put on the Lord Jesus. You say, well, Paul, you've already told me that I have put on the Lord Jesus. Listen to what Paul said in Galatians chapter 3, verse 27. He says, for as many as you were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. You say, well, Paul, I, I've, you told me. That because I put my faith in Jesus, I have already been clothed in Christ. I've already put on Christ. So why are you telling me now? But put on the Lord Jesus. You see, when Paul was speaking in Galatians chapter 3, verse 27, he was talking about putting on the Lord Jesus in a legal sense. In a legal sense. Meaning when you put your faith in Jesus, you were clothed in Jesus. You were clothed in his righteousness. And so as you stood before God to receive judgment, he declared you justified in his sight. So when you first put Jesus on, that was in a legal sense. Now Paul says, okay, you're covered by Jesus in a legal sense. Now you need to put him on in a practical sense. Now it's time to live like you're clothed in Jesus. He says, but put on the Lord Jesus. Listen to how Paul describes this in Colossians chapter 3, starting in verse 1. He says, if then you have been raised with Christ, do this practically. Seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. But put to death, he says, but put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry, making a god out of the things you want. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these two, you once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing as how you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. You see, there is a sense in which you put on Jesus in a legal sense. But there is a whole nother understanding of it where you need to put on Jesus every single day. You need to put on his works of righteousness and make sure that these, these garments of sin, the garments that everybody else in this world wears, that they never touch you. you you're not putting that kind of filth on. No, you're clothing yourself in Christ on a daily basis. That's what Paul is saying. He says, but put on the Lord Jesus and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires, to, to, to feed it. That, that word for provision, he says, make no provision. It actually has the word in it, forethought. But put no thought into how you're going to feed that inner sense 
of sin. He says, don't give it any thought. Don't plan about how you're going to feed your cravings. No, what's the opposite of that? Starve it. Starve it. Don't take the opportunity to fill yourself with filth. What's the old saying? Garbage in, garbage out. Garbage in, garbage out. And Paul says, no, put on the Lord Jesus. Make no forethought. Make no provision for the flesh to gratify its cravings, epithumia, its, its ungodly desires. He says, don't do anything to feed it. A lot of times we, we can seemingly wonder why we are falling into sin, why we are tripping into sin, why, why we seem to stumble, but we don't ever do the math and, th- and realize that many times when we stumble, it's because we've been walking around the potholes. We've like put ourselves in the position of the potholes, and it's hard to stay out of them when that's the only place we walk. It's hard to think pure thoughts if all you consume is filth, whether that be on the TV or through the radio, through the music you listen. It's hard to live a a holy mental life when all we do is consume those types of things. So what do we need to do? We need to make no provision for the flesh. You put yourself around it enough and you will participate in it. Have you ever heard someone say, you spend enough time in a barber shop, you're gonna get a haircut? That's the idea. Just don't even go. Just don't even go. Be nowhere near it. Starve it out. One last admonition from the Apostle Paul here in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. He says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, If there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What should we fill ourselves with? What does he say? What is true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent? These are the things that we ought to be putting ourselves in the path of. Meaning we should be spending more time in God's word feeding on truth and not listening to lies. We ought to spend less time, less time on Netflix and more time thinking about the truth of God and the work of God. We, we should spend less time going to parties and this and that and spend more time with God's people. We should make it a priority to be part of the things that the church has organized for discipleship and for fellowship to encourage one another to live holy lives as we are ready for the coming of Christ. We have to do everything that we can to take off the garments of darkness, the garments of night, and to put on the armor of light. You must live in readiness because of the imminent return of Christ. The second imperative holds true as well. You must live in holiness because of the imminent return of Christ. You must live in holiness because of the imminent return of Christ. Can you imagine that shock of terror? If the Lord were to return at a time that you were living in complete spiritual apathy, and he returns, you hadn't had a thought about him, you, you haven't strived to live your life for him. He was just one stop on your, on your week. It wasn't what you, what you really planned on doing most of the time. And, and there he shows up. And, and, and you're supposed to live in his kingdom forever. If we are going to live in the kingdom of God forever, in pure and holy and spotless lives, friends, I think the question that Paul would pose to us here is this, why wait? Why wait? Why don't we start living like we're in the kingdom now? That's the expectation that Paul is saying here. So what what is our acceptable, reasonable, logical worship? 
being ready, being holy. These are the things that God expects of us. So that when he returns, we're not shrieking from terror. We're we're not frightened because of the unexpected nature because we live in a state of expectancy. The state of unexpected terror that comes upon people, friends, that is a state of unregenerate people. That's that's the kind of, of terror that will come across people who do not know Jesus. When the Jesus that they spurned or the Jesus that they didn't even know about returns in the clouds to judge them and to set up his kingdom and they have no recourse in their actions because they never gave him the time of day, they didn't live their life for him, they didn't call on him as Lord, and their judgment is sealed. The grace that God has shown us is that he has told us about the coming of Christ before it ever happens. And he has made provision for us so that when Christ returns, we do not have to be fearful of judgment. What does it say in Romans chapter 8, verse 1? There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Friends, guess what? We have a responsibility not only to live lives of readiness and holiness. We have a responsibility as the people of God, to go into our community, to go into the workplace, to speak to our neighbors and to our coworkers and make sure that they are ready for the coming of Christ. That is our responsibility. In the book of Ezekiel, there is an example that is given of a watchman on a tower. And the watchman in the tower, the watchman on the wall, he has a responsibility, doesn't he? He, He's able to see what's coming. And if he sees that there is an army coming and the people are going to be slaughtered, the people need to wake and be ready, and the watchman doesn't say anything, guess what? The whole city's blood is on his hands because he had a responsibility as a watchman on the wall. But you know what? If that watchman, if he sees that that terror coming and he turns to the city and he says, repent, repent and get right with God. Be ready. Be holy. Cast your cares on Christ. Call on him. Be saved by the grace of Christ. And if he calls on the people in the city, guess what? His hands before God are clean. We have a responsibility as the Lord's ambassadors, as God's people, to make sure that this community knows about Jesus and his second coming. We have a responsibility to announce the good news to them. Friends, and that is not anybody else's responsibility. God put us at this address for a reason. He stationed us here on the wall. He called us not only to be ready, he called us to make sure other people are ready too. This afternoon as a church, that's what we are doing at four o'clock. We're going into the community. We are sounding the bell saying Jesus is coming, but God has made provision for you. If you will believe in the Lord Jesus, you will give your life over to him. You will become a child of God. You'll be forgiven of your sins and you'll have everlasting life in him. That's our responsibility as a church. And friends, there is no other job that the church has. That is the work. That is the work. Because Christ is coming, wake up, live right. Would you pray with me?